Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for the uh, in incredible introduction. Uh, I don't know if I can live up to. And also, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be in Scotland. I'm really happy to be in Stirling. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, using big data or using social media data. Um, now that we have had the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal and the fake news debacle. And what I'm going to do is take you through the critiques that have developed um, in the last two years and, and of course before that as well, but have really come to the fore in the last couple of years um, <clears throat> with respect to doing social media research. I'll wait. Uh, and so, in particular, I'm going to talk about um, these, these seven things. Um, generally speaking, my research to date has rested on using social media data. Um, so, what I do is I scrape it or, or use APIs and, and repurpose this data for social research. So, I'm not researching. Facebook per se or Twitter per se, although I do that as well, but I'm using their data um, to do social and cultural research. Not so unlike, I think, a lot of the work that you're doing. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about, so I'm with you, uh, however I'm going to critique it. Um, so this is a meta talk. Uh, so I'm actually kind of critiquing myself. If you will. Um, so these are, this is what I'm going to talk about. I, I want to talk about the extent to which social media data, generally speaking, is considered good and, uh, and, and the problems with it. Um, I want to talk about the sort of the return uh, of the human subjects. Um, and this is something that arguably started um, well before Cambridge Analytica. There was a sort of ethics, a sort of minor ethics turn, you could say, in about 2010 in social media research. However, it really came to the fore uh, recently. Um, I, I want to talk about the effects of using uh, commercial data uh, or data that is being collected by companies for very, very different purposes uh, than for research. And what are the kinds of challenges uh, that we have uh, when thinking about the proprietary effects of the data? Um, I want to talk about this term that, that I, I was quite instrumental in kind of pushing in the scholarly community, and this is this idea of repurposing. Um, so not only um, have I argued for the repurposing of data for social research, but also the repurposing of sort of natively digital methods, so the methods that are built into search engines, recommendation systems more broadly online, to even repurpose those. Um, and this is what I've been championing, uh, sort of the, the study of the natively digital or digital methods as being quite distinctive from the importation of social or the migration of social scientific method uh, into uh, into web research. Uh, so I've been I've, I've, so, but but now I want to critique that idea. So what's wrong with repurposing, um, and provide some admonitions or, or some ideas about uh, how to rethink it. Um, recently, uh, and I'll give you the reference at the end, I published a paper with a colleague of mine on post-API research. And it's a term that some people are starting to use, uh, post-API, uh, because of what is uh, increasingly being called locked platforms. Uh, so um, what are the research opportunities now uh, that Facebook, starting with Facebook, but it's reverberating, it's also Twitter, are beginning to narrow the, the, the feeds and are beginning to shut down uh, particular APIs and thereby particular research opportunities and, of course, uh, replace um, the data that we've been collecting independently with their own curated data sets, company curated data sets here. here. Use this instead. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that and some, uh, some alternatives. Um, I, I, I would be remiss, I think, to talk about these sorts of things without talking a little bit about the GDPR. Um, and, and I mean, I, I, I'll go through it briefly. I mean, probably you all are quite familiar with it uh, by now. 
but I wanted to talk about a couple of aspects of it. Um, so the GDPR is actually rather research friendly, and I want to talk about a couple of aspects to it with respect to collecting social media data specifically, um, and and in particular what we're collectively, I think, doing wrong, uh, and what else we can do. Uh, and then finally, I mean, this is this is not me, but th this is uh, some other um, uh, scholars talking a little bit about. Um, what is being referred to as a coming ethics, uh, either crisis or, um, and it has to do with the extent to which computer science has ever been confronted with an ethics crisis before, um, and, it, this, and compared to other sciences. So I'm going to conclude happily uh, with that. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, the, the first point that is oftentimes made with respect to the extent to which social media data could be considered good data um, is the fact that the social media platforms uh, are very, very different from research instruments. They're not like, you know, the, 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 the sensors on, you know, in, on in Hawaii and Mauna Loa that's been collecting carbon uh, 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 air uh, samples for the last 40 years in in the very same way. Uh, so, so th the data is not good in the sense that you can collect it from the beginning of the phenomenon cleanly through the entire phenomenon at, uh, at, and uh, at the end and and sort of completely. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. You'll all be familiar with them. Um, uh, social media platforms or the web more generally has been called unstable. Uh, platforms uh, have ephemeral data. The web has ephemeral data as well. Platforms too. Um, you can think about uh, this on a number of different uh, levels, but one of the things that, that um, interests me is what happens when platforms update themselves. Um, so you know probably if you make a Twitter uh, a data set that when you share it with another colleague, it first goes back to Twitter, where Twitter then looks at whether or not any tweets in your tweet collection have been um, suspended, deleted, uh, etc. So Twitter cleans and updates the, the data before it gets sent to your, to your, to your colleague, before, before it's shared. <coughs> this is because you are expected to be a good partner um, but the data then becomes smaller or it becomes different. So that's, that's a quite minor. However, if you look at, for example, Facebook over time, Facebook before the like button and Facebook after the like button are very, very different, obviously. Uh, nowadays, with the reaction buttons, have, have of course, affected like, like research, right? So if you want to do an over time, uh, analysis of, of engagement, um, then you would have to take into account a lot of different changes. And these, these changes aren't well documented. Um, so I've had a couple of colleagues who've tried to rewrite, tried to write the history of the Facebook interface or the history of Facebook recommendations um, and had the most difficult time. And because until recently, for the web archivists in the room, you know that Facebook had a robot text on their, on their website for 10, 12 years, uh, which, which meant that they were not allowing their archived pages, that, that is to say, you know, their, their FAQs, their policies, etc. I mean, not individual accounts, those wouldn't be archived anyway. But, but um, so, they were, so Facebook was quite opaque about its past uh, as well. So uh, kind of trying to figure out exactly when things changed uh, and why is, is quite difficult. The other thing I want to mention here is not only d does the d do the data change, but also the metrics. Um, so you might be familiar with um, Jonathan Albright's quite famous work in October 2017 when he took the six Russian disinformation pages that were known at the time that had been operating on Facebook, looked them up in CrowdTangle, <coughs> Facebook's archive, so to speak, or Facebook's sort of marketing data side, um, and, and took the engagement scores of those six 
uh, Russian disinformation pages, blacktivists, Har of Texas, United Muslims of America, these sorts of pages, and found they had massive reach, far greater reach, far greater engagement than Zuckerberg testified three days before. Um, so, so he published that on a public tableau, on a, on a, on the, on a public data set that he visualized. And the, day, the day later, Facebook changed the metrics, called up Albright and said, um, we don't really agree with what you're doing. Um, we also don't agree with how you've measured, it, how you've measured reach. <clears throat> he said, well, I'm using your metrics. Um, and um, so they changed the metrics uh, a, a, a day later. Um, this is actually well documented. It's not this sort of just this one this personal conversation that I've had with Albert. Um, so, so, th so this is the, there. There's instability on a number of levels. <clears throat> the second point is that um, that yeah, platform rules. So th these are um, rules that you're you're meant to follow. Um, so these, in, in, a, in, a, in a number of ways, are, are uh, not well suited for research. So, um, uh, as I said before, the, the, the data becomes updated when you share it. But there are also a number of other elements to this. Um, so you, you're a, you're, you become you sort of enter into a partnership when you when you um, use the API. Uh, and when you do so, you agree to terms of service. Now, these terms of service are the developer terms of service, and they're, quite, they're kind of different from the, the other the, the general user's terms of service. And these developer terms of service are quite interesting. So for Twitter, you're not supposed to segment an audience. I mean, this is something I do all the time. Uh, so so, so, so I, I'm interested in... Um, studying the alt-right on Twitter. So how can I study the alt-right? Well, um, I do this a number of ways. Normally I make a list of key players and then I'll query them for um, who mentions them or who they mention and then I create a larger network of sort of an at-mention network. Yeah? So this, is, this would constitute some sort of movement of the alt-right. That's, that's so, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate uh, research undertaking. That's against the terms. Um, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, and so, the, and, and there are a bunch of these other platform rules, and we can go, th go through a, n a number of platforms and, and talk about these. Um, the third one, uh, and this is, this is sort of a bit counterintuitive, or maybe not in the least bit, um, but, but um, so it's very interesting how social media companies provide uh, privacy tools for users. Um, of course, these are these. This is privacy on the front end. A lot of scholars call this social privacy. It's it's not privacy on the back end. It's not that. So they're they're still selling your data, um, right? But it's just privacy on the front end. What you show, how the extent to which you expose yourself, right? So this is social privacy. It's called. Um, but but the more controls that are given. Uh, of course, um, the more uneven the data becomes. Right? So, so if uh, if certain users don't want their likes to be counted, for example, or what have you, or uh, etc., um, you get you get. So, so, so the more privacy that's given, uh, which is a good thing, uh, however, uh, makes the data poorer, so to speak. Um, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but nevertheless. Uh, so, so these are some of the issues that people talk about when they talk about um, uh, good data. Uh, the second point I want to take up uh, concerns uh, human subjects. Um, it's interesting how with uh, the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal in particular, uh, we were confronted with the fact that um, up until recently, uh, we were quite loose with uh, with uh, human subject data, uh, and I think a lot of people still are. Um, so I, I think that I, I think that people still don't know what to do with a tweet collection. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe there's someone in this room who says I actually know what to do. But I think generally speaking, um, the extent to which that is human subject data, and and then what that means. 
uh, is, I think, is something that hasn't been properly uh, grappled with. It's because uh, these profiles in the computer uh, parlance are still objects, right? Uh, and so and they're objects in, 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 field. they're in fields, uh, in databases. And this is how they're, they're generally treated. Um, now, when we then subsequently begin to work with this data, uh, oftentimes we, when we talk about uh, ethics, um, we first talk about, uh, I think, a lot of people, maybe not you, but me, uh, about compliance. So we, we first start with compliance. And then and say, well, um, um, is it true that because the data are public and the users agreed to the terms of service, then everything's, everything, anything goes. This is, a, this is a quite a popular position uh, within certain circles uh, in, um, in, in data science. I don't know, I'm looking over here, but maybe that's not true. But, uh, but for many data scientists that I've worked with, um, that's at, at the next level um, when talking about terms of service um, is um, this extent to which it, we use it as, uh, as a kind of cover for what we want to do. So if you, if you look at Twitter, in particular, um, and the user terms of service, it says again and again and again, your data is public and open to the world. It will be used by, for purposes of advertising. And it also says specifically academic research. So when you post, you should expect that it, should, that it will be used for that. Right? So, so if you look at the terms and, 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 and actually how the terms have changed over the years, they become more and more explicit. Uh, and and more readable, um, you know, these sorts of things. So the so the fact that people never read them and they're quite opaque and legally and, and full of legalese, that that argument um, is is um, sort of it's true, <laughs> still true. Uh, but you know people have been working on the companies have been working on that. However, there's the there's the third position um, which has been developed by Helen Nissenbaum and others called contextual privacy. And this is considered to be the, the, the sort of leading edge, or I mean, there's more than this. It's the ethics of care, the feminist ethics of care is also considered to be a leading edge. But contextual privacy. And contextual privacy uh, is about that the users, when sharing their data and their information uh, in that particular context, were not expecting or considering or thinking about that it would be used uh, by researchers uh, to map the climate change debate, as we do. Um, and, 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 uh, and the question is, how do we respect uh, contextual privacy? And how to do that? So we'll come back to that. The other interesting uh, debate, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, um, but um, so there, there are human subjects anyway, right? But are they also authors? Uh, so are we citing them as opposed to using their traces? Are we, are we citing them? Uh, and, and so this goes, goes to the heart of sort of what's an author. I mean, to be granted authorial status, normally the product has to be from the sweat of one's brow. I mean, there is, in courts, there is a sort of level of what, can, what constitutes a sort of uh, an authored product or a creative output. However, um, you know, sort of very, very short texts, uh, haikus, or whatever, also fall into this. And, and what about a tweet? What about a particularly clever tweet? Um, so this was an issue that, that came up when uh, we, did some, we did some sentiment analysis on um, the tweets uh, in the in the three hours, it's like around the election of Donald Trump. So like right around the time when it became known that Trump had won. And it's sort of like the hour before and then during and then one hour after. Um, and so we did some sentiment analysis on those and, and we found like the happiest tweet, the most joyful tweet, and the angriest. Right? And we, so we put them up there. Um, and then we had the debate about whether or not this was you know, reciting 
or whether or not uh, we need we should ask permission and human subjects etc so this is a this is also an interesting um, sort of uh, avenue okay <clears throat> um, a lot of my um, colleagues when I'm making arguments for repurposing Facebook data, Twitter data, um, Instagram, um, Tumblr, YouTube, uh, the rest. Um, what they oftentimes uh, say to me is, 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 you know, that's that is commercial data. That's data that was collected for a completely different purpose, um, and it's also data that, if you if you think about its history has become increasingly commodified over the past number of years. Twitter is an excellent example. So Twitter, which some of my colleagues call like the last web, the last vestige of Web 2.0. So they're, they're still, still, they still kind of have that slight spirit where they allow, you know, mashups and, and sort of, you know, how naive we were, you know, taking data from 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 one uh, company and uh, f you know and then plotting it on Google Maps and then uh, using if if then then but, uh, like all these sort of mashup things. So they're they're still they're the, probably the last vestige. However, um, and we were talking about this yesterday with someone I think um, about um, what a data set now costs. So so um, there there was a tool called um, called TechStifter. Uh, which you could very easily sort of uh, run a query, hit return, so that so if you just do hashtag hashtag climate change and the keyword climate change, normally if you do the hashtag, it also gives you the keyword back. Um, and you wanted to get that from 2006 to the present or whatever 2007, however far it goes back. Um, this I did this last year. This would be uh, fifty-four thousand dollars. Maybe that's not a lot here. Maybe it is. Um, it strikes me as quite a lot uh, for Twitter data um, in the end, um, but nevertheless, so 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 so, this, so Twitter in particular is one of the few companies that are they're selling data to to uh, they're, they're selling the data. It's one of the products, um, not only for marketing purposes uh, but for other purposes. Um, I've had I've been with the Association of Internet Researchers together, uh, negotiating with Twitter to try to get academic uh, arrangements. Uh, th these these go I mean also with Facebook and their new Social Science One project, which I'll criticize in a minute, um, is also uh, also one of these where where uh, there's 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 questions of of what data uh, uh, costs. The second part of proprietary effects are the archives. Um, the archives are um, held by the companies, um, and the companies and the companies themselves update them. Right? Where Facebook are the Russian disinformation pages? They're gone. Um, so we can reconstruct through some traces online things that had been, you know, screenshotted or re-grand, reposted. You know, there, there are, you know, we can reconstruct part of that. But um, but that stuff is is gone. Why is it gone? Uh, well, it might be in the public interest, but but these pages broke, you know, rules um, on on Twitter, um, on or on Facebook, or on Instagram. Um, in, uh, Instagram, for example, um, is now a sort of locked platform. So you are not able to, they, they ended their API in June 2016. They don't have an archive. Uh, Facebook um, has now committed to a, a political ad archive, and they have now a new API, political ad API. So, so if, uh, you know, we'll start building tools on that and see what we can do with that. Um, but it's very, very limited. It's already been criticized. Th their archive replaced three NGO projects, uh, which one by the Mozilla Foundation, which was a, which were watchdog projects uh, on uh, on Facebook. So Facebook, when they when they brought out their their new um, uh, political ad archive, they uh, cut access to or made it impossible for Mozilla and the other watchdogs to keep their own archives. So they they also are prevent others 
uh, from, from archiving. You'll know that the first 10 years of Twitter is at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Library of Congress hasn't been able to handle it. It's too big. Talk about big data. It's too big. Uh, for the for the library, they also don't have the funding to create query machines or the similar experiences that you would have when querying Twitter or querying uh, Twitter's uh, uh, API. Uh, but because it became so big, they decided to stop. Um, so as of January of this year, I think it is, um, there's no more uh, Twitter public archive. Um, so so now um, they're only making special collections. So, so this is a quite a major uh, issue. The other thing is um, on proprietary effects is that um, is that researchers uh, were considered um, uh, if you want to do your research properly, like collect data very well, um, you need to do things that um, that that would make you seem like a spammy user. So you need to set up multiple accounts um, to get around the rate limiting, to get around the limits that are set, so that you can get you know, reasonably complete data sets if there's a particular event. So if there's a disaster, or there's an election, or there's, you know, some, if there's a Brexit vote, um, you need to have a, a number of accounts running in order to get uh, a, quite a decent amount of the, of the data, or pay for it. Um, but if you have a number of accounts running at the same time, you're 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 not doing uh, it properly, um, and so and you and you'll be you'll be you'll be cut off. Um, you will be um, you can also be banned. This is uh, this 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 can happen. Um, yes. Yeah, so these are these proprietary effects that are that are uh, that are quite diff makes make doing science productively quite difficult uh, with um, with social media data. Okay, um, so this is this is this term that um, that is something that I've really pushed for um, this idea of repurposing, and um, I want to now critique it. Um, so, what's interesting? I mean, th this is um, the 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 head of um, the movement of platform cooperativism, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Trevor Schultz. Um, he and a number of other digital labor and other critical Marxist, neo-Marxist researchers have called the platform's intent, social media companies' intent, um, uh, crowd, not crowdsourcing, crowd fleecing. Um, you know, this, of course, they have really beautiful language. So they, they call um, uh, this uh, what's happening um, data extraction, the new extraction industry. Social media companies, um, and this is this is very very different. Um, so so they're also from what science is about. So this is a kind of it's almost a sort of it's, it's more it's, it's not ethical it's moral some moral points. So so what are you doing? Um, uh, you know, re relying on this this sort of data extraction, this crowd fleecing um, for for data. Uh, um, so, and what is, what is the, 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 the most critical point and the one that really hits hard at um, the, the kind of work that I'm doing um, is the second one. And that is that, that social media algorithms are set up um, to make you interact with the system. Um, YouTube is set up so you binge watch. Right, so that's what it's about. What Facebook is about is increasing uh, the amount of the amount of interactivity. Um, if you are on, I don't know, even the academic software, ResearchGate.net, Academia.edu. Uh, every time you go to one of the one of those sites, you get an email. Have you noticed? About fifteen seconds later, um, <coughs> saying these are your weekly stats, or uh, could you help us? Um, classify an author or something, right? They want your interactivity, they want your attention, uh, they want your... Um... So what they're doing is they're, they're driving, principally driving the consumption of social media, and that's it. 
So when you like, it's about social media consumption. So, so likes are not genuine likes. So this is the argument. I mean, it's not a, it's not a sort of such a super interesting point. But when you think about it, uh, then it, the, the entire enterprise of using social media data is is, uh, is called into question. The, the activities that are being captured are not genuine. They're not anything. They're they're, they're not. What you are capturing is not um, action or activities in the wild. You're capturing activities in media. Um, that's very different. Um, I'm, I made this point uh, before, but, I, but I, it's, this is slightly different um, about um, because it's, it has to do with repurposing. But the last one is when you're repurposing, um, you're uh, being compromised, arguably, uh, not only morally, um, but uh, also in um, you know this this larger apparatus that you that you need to set up and defend. Um, so how do you defend these against these other other points? And this is a sort of maybe a kind of discussion point uh, as well. Um, okay, I, I want to just mention. Um, a few ideas about uh, alternatives. Um, and I think, generally speaking, um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, maybe, a, maybe it's sort of slowly going away now, and, and people are moving to back to business as usual. Um, maybe not. I mean, business as usual, like it's, 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 there's no longer actually, it's certainly with Facebook. Um, <clears throat> A little bit with Twitter, uh, certainly with Instagram. The, the, there's no more. They're no longer business as usual. Yeah, the, the things have changed, um, and we right now at the Digital Methods Initiative, we have the, one of our kind of flagship tools, NetViz, <clears throat> um, like FacePager and Net Analytic and, and other Facebook data extraction software. Um, we were all invited by Facebook to reapply for access, and none of us uh, were approved. Um, so, <laughs> so, so it's all. So right now, it's sort of zombie software in the sense that it's not, it's not, it's not approved, but it's not shut off. And and what's interesting is that um, you'll only discover that, for example. Um, you can't get uh, comments anymore with in, in when you're doing group analysis. Suddenly, you're like, oh, okay, so we better write that down um, for other researchers to come this way, and we better change our textbooks. And, I mean, it's really affecting, um, you know, business as usual, so to speak. Uh, so that, I mean, that's that's Facebook, Twitter. Um, you know, you get you you will receive an email uh, saying you know the, the way you you're you're currently collecting data is against our terms of service. You're like, oh, we weren't we didn't know that we didn't know that they had changed or, or so. So this is happening uh, now, and what is interesting um, is this the discussion has been, been reopened about scraping. You know, now scraping uh, became a dirty word. Uh, over the last six years, I mean, I don't know, the data scientists in the room, well, this is an interesting subject matter, what you think. My interpretation is that the, it was really pushed by the social media uh, companies. <clears throat> Use our API. Scraping is, is, is unethical, in, uh, improper. You know, it, it, it slowly started to, to have a kind of... And people will ask, um, are you collect, are you collecting that data properly, and, and that what you used to mean, you know, completely, and which now means you know you're using the API, right? You're not, you know, you're not um, scraping. Um, so, but now I think that conversation is 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 opening up again. Um, of you know, so if if social media companies are go are going to lock down, um, you know, is it? Uh, you know when when is scraping okay again, um, and what are the arguments in, in that favor? And it's and quite interesting <clears throat> that you know um, 
that th that uh, there's a there's a new book uh, out MIT Press called Spotify Teardown. I can hi highly recommend it for people who are into this sort of thing. Um, and there's a very strong case made in this book for um, for alternative modes of data gathering. With this was with Spotify. And Spotify tried to sue them, or they tried they had a cease and desist letter because they did all sorts of interesting things. They created their own band, a, research, a researcher band, and, and uploaded songs and, and you know, et cetera, watched how their whole platform would work. Um, but they, they, also, um, uh, they also revealed that Spotify actually started as a pirated music, pirated MP3 uh, platform, uh, which the company didn't like. And, and it, anyway, they did a bunch of these things, quite provocative, quite inventive, very creative, um, and which you would, you would, it's quite laudable, the kind of work that they did. Um, but if you look at it through the lens of only API data gathering is proper, um, then uh, it looks quite bad what they, what they did. Um, so now that discussion um, is, um, is opening up again, um, breaking the term <coughs> of service uh, and why that might be actually uh, okay. <clears throat> The other uh, discussion is about um, um, uh, small data. It's like now that we're in the, in the age of big data, why are we talking about small data? Um, uh, and you know, coming up with sort of robust uh, techniques to create collections uh, rather than or, or, and, and samples. Remember those two words, <laughs> rather than you know, the big. Um, and so how do you do that now, and how do you do that well? Um, uh, digital ethnography, um, how is that developing? So these are some of the alternatives uh, that, that, that people are talking about. Um, user studies, uh, et cetera. Um, there, however, I want to talk about the fact that, um, I mean, who's left Facebook? Anyone? Ah, OK. So, um, yeah, and who almost left Facebook? Okay, yeah. So, so I mean, so if you if you start, so last year, um, you will have read in the newspaper, probably, you know, I don't know whether it's the Guardian or somewhere else, that have these headlines saying uh, the the top five alternatives to Facebook. Right? And then you're thinking, ah, this is a sort of listicle. It's a new media format, anyway. But anyway, so you get the five, and then you've never heard of them. <laughs> Diaspora, Mastodon, it's like, what are these? Um, and uh, so, so you're getting this discussion. Um, and then the other one is, well, what about our own stuff? And I already mentioned ResearchGate and Academia.edu. Do you know that Academia.edu is owned uh, by venture capitalists? And ResearchGate was just bought uh, by one of the Dutch publishing, uh, well, I'm being filmed, I don't want to say vultures, but houses, large ones. Um, so these particular platforms them, themselves um, are rather kind of you know, commodified, etc. Not They're not, in that sense, so different from uh, the logics of the other ones. Um, and I mean, there are some alternatives, uh, but are we using them? You know? Are we using, I don't know which ones in the, the heritage studies, but um, there's scholarly hub and there's, uh, uh, there's humanities common. Anyway, um, these sorts of alternatives. There's also the, um, the idea of alternative models. Uh, this is currently being actively studied. Um, not as much work. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you search Google Scholar for, you know, like Facebook versus platform cooperativism, You'll find very few articles on the on this second term, uh, but there is there is uh, work on uh, on alternative models uh, as well. Okay, um, I'm sort of coming to the close, um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the GDPR. I think this is something that is now on everybody's mind in some ways uh, in the academic community. Um, and, then, and, and then 
you might ask yourself, well, what's the relationship of it to uh, social media data and, and what's that about? Uh, well, I'm not going to answer that question, um, <laughs> but I'm going to talk around it. Um, and what I want to uh, talk about is a, a couple of things. So first of all, now I want to go back to this question of Twitter um, and and what kind of what we're, whether a Twitter data collection um, uh, is um, um, GDPR compliant. Um, so a lot of people like myself um, have a piece of software that collects tweets, and once you set it running, it just keeps going. Um, and so it was it was it was at one point you were interested in collect collecting tweets uh, on. Um, um, Brexit, maybe still are. But uh, over time, um, you know, maybe that research project ended, or but you keep collecting it. So that's that is um, that is actually not uh, kosher. Uh, so one of the things that the GDPR is, is is about is, in some ways, um, rethinking uh, how your collection practices with social media data. And it's very conventional or traditional. So, so you should have, if you collect data, you should have a project, an actual project. And this project should probably have a website or some kind of um, documentation uh, that has research questions and then has a duration. Uh, so this is quite, it's quite interesting because you're like, oh, um, so all of these data collection of social media that are just running um, need to be thought about, uh, at least if they want to make them GDPR uh, compliant. Um, that's one point. Um, the second one is uh, that um, the, the idea of uh, consent um, is an interesting one in big data. So I'll just take Twitter again. <clears throat> so if we're collecting Twitter data um, and we have a million tweets on, you know, uh, hashtag heritage or something, which maybe one of you actually has uh, in this room. Um, what, what do we do with this? Um, so it's interesting, um, Twitter, so Weibo in China, um, you become a public figure uh, at, um, at 10,000 followers. With Twitter, you become a public figure, at least in their recent data set release, the Russian and Iranian trolls. Um, uh, they hashed all users with uh, fewer than 5,000 followers. So it's interesting, so like Twitter and Weibo, they're, they're kind of deciding what, and, and, and according to a kind of data point, what constitutes a public figure. So this is the first step. Um, but the second one is, is, uh, is you have all this, these other tweets from uh, pub, non-public figures. Um, and so you could say, okay, so the, the normal um, kind of qualitative social science rules apply, you know, you sort of anonymize and et cetera. Um, but when do you do that? Should they be in the? Should you be collecting that at all? Um, and uh, and if you want to publish the the actual um, account names uh, or uh, actual tweet content, <clears throat> how do you? I mean, what do you do? And then in big data, it's impractical. It is always argued to uh, ask for consent. So then what? So the GDPR is really interesting. And so what it says is it says it, it agrees with you. Um, it says, yes, it's a, it can be impractical. And so what you do is you post it uh, online and you invite people to opt out. I mean, you, you should, it wants you to opt in, but you, you can invite people to opt out. Um, and uh, that's one thing. Another thing is, is um, to begin to think about like, consent bots or you know, sort of automated means by which you could uh, ask uh, permission or or ask uh, or invite opting out these sorts of things. So this is um, this is um, one of the issues. Um, um, another one is uh, uh, just going to talk about um, 
another idea of publicness. Uh, so, so, um, and the changing ideas of publicness. Um, so, uh, so previously I talked about how some researchers think, well, the data are already public, so they can be used. Um, and the rejoinder of saying no, there's some there's, there's such, such thing as called contextual privacy, and, and users do not expect this to be uh, be used by researchers in this particular way. Um, some people are arguing that that um, um, given the the, the 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 way in which people are using the settings these days, um, the, you know, social privacy, that that this is not only interesting to study. Um, uh, but it can be used in, but it can be kind of itself repurposed. So privacy settings um, could be part of the research. Uh, so you could say, well, these these users that had this setting can appear on our map, whereas these users that didn't, etc. So so this is one of the interesting uh, points being made uh, these days. Um, uh, I just want to talk about one or two things. Uh, very briefly uh, to, to conclude on this. One of them is the duration. So, so kind of, of data storage and future proofing and these sorts of uh, ideas. Um, and the new legislature of the, uh, of the right to be forgotten, the right to oblivion. Um, and the, the extent to which this uh, holds for database subjects. Uh, so, so um, um, so the GDPR is quite explicit in saying that the project should have a duration and, and data should be actually uh, um, uh, gotten rid of after that. Um, and, uh, and unless there's some sort of legitimate um, use, and this needs to be actually formulated. So if you want to keep, you know, so when your project ends, which is going to end in October, this particular project, and you have a Twitter data set that you collected for the project and didn't use, um, the, you know, if you want to be GDPR compliant or you want to follow the spirit of it um, as well, then, then you should uh, uh, actually think about how to make it secure um, and, uh, and, and actually have a kind of project associated with it whether it's a slumbering project that has questions, duration, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so this is, this, is, this, is a, this is one of the, uh, I mean, so what one does with data um, uh, moving forward is, is something that requires attention, far more attention than, than that we've had before. And what's interesting about it is that this, does, this doesn't apply or applies less or something to data sets in repositories that you publish. Um, so when you publish a data set that's connected to your particular research paper, um, that what I just said doesn't apply. Uh, so it's not this floating data set that you had for other purposes. Uh, so th those those uh, should be kept. Um, and uh, I don't. I mean, I think it's also important just in, in in sort of passing to talk about whether or not you're using these sorts of tools. Uh, whether they're, they're, they're open source ones or whether they're commercial ones like Fig, Figshare and things like this, um, which are uh, tools that enable you to link your data set with a particular paper and publication and actually get a DOI number for your data set. Um, and these, this is, this is, uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's peripheral to the GDPR. Uh, discussion, but if you have that, um, <clears throat> then it's your data set is like tethered and considered legit, uh, as opposed to these ones that are floating around. Okay, I just want to conclude uh, with um, with this sort of ominous um, title. Uh, so this ominous title um, uh, came from. Uh, an article in a newspaper in 2018, um, which argued that that computer science, as I said at the at the top, <clears throat> has not had its kind of crisis moment as of yet. And the question was whether Cambridge Analytica um, was actually that moment. And the argument was 
um, that chemistry had dynamite, physics, the nuclear bomb, biology, eugenics, civil engineering, bridge collapses, etc. I mean, I know this is quite drastic. Um, um, I don't know how, co how comparable um, you know, these like, massive data breaches are. Uh, but nevertheless, there was this, this question of, of when computer science uh, will, like these other sciences, actually have, um, you know, kind of like codify um, uh, these sorts of ethics and things in, in ways that are, that, are, uh, that are similar to the other sciences. Uh, not that they don't exist, uh, norms, etc., but but this this was this was something that uh, this was an MIT uh, engineer saying you know there's an issue uh, within uh, within computer science and I think um, the issue um, has something to do with this difference between uh, ethics as a sort of foundational principle and as, as a principle of compliance. Right? So I've been talking uh, uh, now and then about to make it compliant, compliant, right? But but um, you know, there, there are particular uh, ethical uh, uh, stances and practices and principles that, that could be underlying fundamentally, like a feminist ethics of care, uh, which would be, uh, uh, that could underlie the, the, the research practices uh, more, more fundamentally. Um, now, <clears throat> the other radical, this is sort of the opposite position, uh, which I also to touch on and this is the, the third one um, where where one could say actually um, that these privacy settings which I just invited us to think about repurposing aren't privacy settings at all um, so if you're a sort of an ethic you know sort of uh, have a particular kind of ethics foundational ethics uh, of your project you would probably like a little bit more cynically call the, the social media privacy settings actually the publicity settings right so so you're you, when you're when you're working with your settings you're managing your publicity it's a it's a it's not an, uh, it's not about pri privacy is the wrong word there um, and uh, and so so um, you know so sort of thinking about that that people have you know um, uh, have engaged in their uh, their ideas of what their, of, you know, their feelings about what they want to show and what they don't want to show meaningfully um, you know they've grappled with their privacy meaningfully it's actually not true um, so that's but then there's the other radical position um, of um, of this um, which 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 is not exactly the Mark Zuckerberg position of a few years ago, where, where he says, well, privacy no longer exists. Um, but, um, uh, but the idea uh, that, um, that increasingly uh, what everything is uh, public um, or, or everything is sort of like previous, it could be construed as like previously private. Um, and the question here is how to uh, kind of uh, get back, pri like, like how to sort of recreate or, or, or return to uh, some uh, idea of, uh, of, 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 pri of proper privacy. So what is, what could be, the, what is the future of privacy? So, um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I just want to put up um, these uh, papers. So the, what the, this talk, uh, is sort of written up in this article uh, and that article and and if you want to still do digital methods <laughs> if you still want to do digital methods after this um, this book uh, uh, came out uh, like two days ago so thank you very much okay.